They call a black border notice in the newspaper. It's got a black border around it uh, that says that our proposed levy is 12% higher than last year's revenue, and we're going to have a public hearing on November 21st, and come one, come all, and we'll explain why we're doing what we're doing. And so we have to, and if we don't follow those procedures, then even if our levy is 12% higher than last year, the county clerk will not give us that, give us those funds unless we file a certificate with our levy that says we've complied. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's all about. A, a real common strategy these days, to, uh, because some units of government don't want to raise more questions or cause concern among the taxpayers, is uh, to levy something less than 5%. 4.9%. If our levy, our proposed levy is 4.9% higher than last year's revenue, the truth in taxation does not apply and we need not uh, publish the black border notice and we need not have a public hearing. Other units of government, as a matter of course, publish the black border notice every year, whether it's 1% or 3% or 4.9% or 12%. As a matter of course, they do that. So. Uh, it's, it's statutorily required, that is, the publication of the black border notice and the holding of a public hearing is statutorily required only if our proposed levy is 5% or more higher than last year's uh, actual tax extension. Under F, the, uh, uh, the issue comes up uh, occasionally or frequently um, as to how much should we carry in operating reserves. In other words, we don't zero out all our fund balances every single year. We've got cash flow needs, and obviously we've got to have money on hand. So we can carry money, you know, let's just take our operating fund, our general operating fund. We can carry money over from one fiscal year to the next fiscal year. How much should we carry over? How much should we keep in reserve? Depends on who you talk to. You need three months worth, you need six months worth, so as we're approaching the end, a uh, whole year's worth, as we're approaching the end of our fiscal year, we say, okay, well, we have, we have funds available. Should we carry them into a, over as an operating reserve, or should we do something else with them, such as put them in a special reserve fund for future capital improvement projects that we've identified? Another option is we have money left over. Let's reduce our levy next year. Can we do that? Yeah, we can do that. So it's a, you need to take a look and see where are we, how much in operating reserves should we carry from, and, it can, and the same concept applies to the various special funds that we have, IMRF or audit or whatever. We can carry a reserve in any of those funds from one year to the next. Is it possible that we are, we're carrying too much in reserves? What if we had, hypothetical, what if we had uh, a, a, an operating reserve that would cover us for two years of operations, if we didn't get another nickel, we could pay all our bills for the next two years based upon what we have in reserve. Is that a problem? Yes. The reason is that um, owners of property can file what they call tax objections mm -hmm. saying, I don't want you, I'm not paying my tax because you've got enough money already. You don't need to levy anymore because you've got enough, your operating reserve is a full two years worth of uh, expenses. So give me a break, don't levy my tax, don't levy any taxes this year. And as a matter of fact, I'm filing a formal written objection, I'm not paying my library tax because you've got adequate, more than adequate reserves. You've got an unreasonable accumulation. That's the language that's used in the case law. And the case law basically has uh, provided a standard that says that one year's worth of operating reserves is not an unreasonable accumulation. If you've got more than that, you're at risk for property tax, for tax objections from property owners. So if our operating reserves is at, at a year's worth of expenses, if we don't get another nickel, we can pay all our bills for another <clears throat> year, that's okay, but if it's more than that, then we risk having tax objections. And uh, so that's what that's all about in terms of the uh, operating reserves. If, again, it's rare that you would have, if, if you've got a substantial amount of operating reserve and you're, you're debating what to do with it, your choices are 
put some of it in a special reserve fund. If you, I don't know, do you have a, you, if you've got a special reserve fund, and typically, that you know, the exception to the rule about unreasonable accumulations, this one-year standard that comes about through the case law, the exception to that, which allows you to put money as much money as you want, and not be subject to tax objections, is you is the special reserve fund, which allows you to accumulate virtually an unlimited amount of money in your special reserve fund, provided you have a plan and, an est and a cost estimate for what you're going to do with it. So you could accumulate, you say, okay, well, in a perfect world, uh, we're going to build a satellite facility. Uh, we're going to remodel this facility. Whatever it happens to be, that, that special reserve fund could accumulate millions of dollars. And you know, and the rationale would be, if we accumulate that money over time, then we don't have to borrow the funds. We don't have to issue bonds for a capital improvement project. And as long as you have a plan for those funds and a cost estimate, you can accumulate millions and millions of dollars in there. And so that's a decision that you can make each year as you're approaching the end of your fiscal year based upon your fiscal position at that point. Say, OK, here's the amount of money we have. Uh, we want to carry forward a full 12 months worth of uh, operating reserves, or we're only going to carry nine months. We've still got extra money. What are we going to do with it? We're going to put it in our special reserve fund. We're going to lower our levy, um, that type of thing. One of the downsides, of course, of lowering, lowering your levy is that, uh, and we haven't gotten into that, that's the, that's the tax cap issue, the so-called PTEL. If we lower our levy because we've got too much money, then that can come back and haunt us with future levies because our future levies are limited based upon prior revenues that we receive. So we need to be very cautious if we uh, if we're going to do uh, if we're going to do that. So uh, I hope I answered your question about E and F. Yes. So when you say it can come back to haunt you, don't isn't there a, a time frame when you can raise it back up if you lower it? There's a uh, there's a kind of a quirk in the statute that says that uh, basically when the county clerk looks at, uh, let's, let's take this hypothetical. We decide in, uh, in a fiscal year we're going to reduce our levy. And so the next year we want to take our levy back up again. And there's a statute that gives you a, what I'll call it a, a three year look back window. And the statute says that, so, so that a, let's say, a conservative levy in one particular year doesn't haunt us prospectively or for future levies, that the county clerk will use the highest revenue or the highest extension in the last three years rather than the extension from the previous year. So, and the theory is that we don't want to penalize you indefinitely and we're going to give you a give you a break. We'll let you we'll let it, let you use the highest revenue in the last three years. It's a little bit tricky because you have to be careful about uh, um, whether or not that that can be used more than one time. There's some there's some debate about whether that can be that three year window applies more than just the, the one year. But it's an option that's available uh, for a library district or a park district. The, the PTEL applies across the board to all units of local government, parks, schools, forest preserves, you name it. Um, so you're not penalized if you want to be take a conservative approach in one particular year. If you, if you do it more than once, we need to be take a pretty hard look at our uh, prior extensions to see that we're not establishing a new base level that's going to haunt us um, in the future. When you say more than once, once over three years, once over the lifetime of the library, what once over? Well, yeah. Once the one time that you that you use it. So the second time you use it, you're gonna have, you would have to com basically I would confer with the county clerk and say, what's the what year's tax extension are you going to compare us to the next time we the, when we levy <clears throat> next year? Okay. But is the is that? Because of the Truth and Taxation Act, that they, you'd look at the county clerk, or that's the PTEL? That's the PTEL. Okay. No, that's the PTEL. And, and, you know, back to your question, your question about the Truth and Taxation, you know, unless uh, about the only units of government that have to be, you know, concerned about 
Truth in Taxation Act, which is why a lot of them use the 4.9 percent. They want to maximize their revenue without having to publish the black border notice. About the only time that it's really a concern is if you've got major new growth coming into your area. You've got three new big box stores that are going into the library district, and that the, the new property that comes in is not subject to PTEL, and we said well, we want to capture all that revenue, but oops, we forgot to publish the black border notice under the Truth in Taxation Act. So the county clerk will say, sorry, I can't give you all, all of that new revenue from the big box stores that just went in because you failed to publish the black border notice. So the only time you, you know, unless you've got major new growth in your area, and in this, in this area, you know, I mean, you know, the suburbs are all coterminous, and so there's not a lot of, it's not like you're in a rural area where the, the farm next to the city limits is suddenly going to be big box, mm -hmm. um, or a, a significant new residential development where you've got a whole bunch of new growth coming in, and you want to capture that revenue, then you'd be much more concerned about making sure that you did the black border notice uh, to make sure that the county clerk would give you um, that additional revenue. Uh, anyway, open meetings, freedom of information. Um, you know, I as I say, I'm, I'm here to answer whatever yeah, questions. I think I know we're going to have agenda. to move on with the meeting. It's now 8 o'clock. Right. Can I um, ask him one more question? Yes, you may Excuse ask me. one more question. Discussions between among trustees. What about email and contemporaneous communications? Okay. Uh, my advice is both for OMA and FOIA is don't use emails. Don't use your personal email devices to communicate with other trustees. All you're doing is you're creating an issue. Uh, so, if you you know emails, if you're using the library district, you have the trustees have individual. Uh, they use their individual emails currently. Personal. Through the library. No. no. Okay. Own personal currently, list. they use personal emails. Yeah, be be very very careful about that because. Um, the, the contemporaneous communication issue is, a, is an OMA issue, and under OMA, you can be in violation of the Open Meetings Act if you have, if there's an email exchange and it starts off with one trustee and another trustee, and it's just the two of them. That's not an Open Meetings Act violation. But if, if you get into a, I'll call it a chat room site type situation or reply all, <laughs> And all of a sudden, that within a period of a few hours, there's an exchange of information via emails involving more than the, the original two trustees. That is likely to be determined to be a contemporaneous communication. It's not truly an open meeting like we're sitting here, but it's an exchange, it's a discussion of public business in a contemporaneous type setting, and that can be a violation of, of the Open Meetings Act. So, Would you recommend it? the trustees have a library email account or so not? that that was that's probably a safer a safer way and on that account the uh, trust the, you know all that the library director would be included in uh, those communications so we have a, a, a clear paper trail about emails that discuss library business are we so if we do that, are we permitted to have an email exchange with more no. than one no. trustee? No, still no, but it helps us out under under FOIA. Those email exchanges, if they discuss public business, library business, it may not be a violation of OMA, but it could be a violation. Of, but it could be doc emails that have to be produced under FOIA as a discussion of public business. I am. That's why I say stay away from the from the emails. If if the email if if it's imperative. Um, there, there hasn't been a, a, a ruling that says that um, public business includes procedural issues like can you meet, can we change the committee meeting to Tuesday rather than Thursday and so forth. Is that, you know, substantive public business? Probably not. That's probably not a problem. But the easiest, by far the easiest thing is just avoid it altogether, and then you don't have to have, have to worry about a fight with uh, the public access counselor as, as to uh, whether the documents are to be produced. And you don't want to have somebody looking at your personal records to decide which emails were personal and which ones were library related. Mm -hmm. So just just stay away from it. 
All right. So, um, sorry to be so long winded. Thank you. No, 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 I, I think we're pretty good about yeah. our, our, our email communications. We just do one way almost always. Yeah, right. So just and FYI, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Um, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Roger. Um, next item on our order of business um, is public comment. We reverse that. Jeff, I think you were here. Uh, you contacted us. You wanted to speak on uh, the tooth and taxation. Is that it? No, I don't know. On the levy, rather. I don't have anything to say. No, he's oh, okay. Okay, he's not. He's not okay, okay, you're not the person. Okay, I, you're, I mistook you for somebody else. I, I apologize. Um, the next item is the open um, oh, minutes. He, he said he did email you earlier. Okay. I emailed you questions. Be quick. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. He I'm is confused. the same. Yes, he is the. the oh, okay. But he doesn't want to. You don't want to speak. Oh, okay. Um. Well, thanks. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. Okay. Um, so we're on our agenda. Then yeah. the next item on the agenda is the uh, approval of the minutes.